thanks everyone for coming today to celebrate the work of Professor of Politics, Kat Owens. Uh, and the whale, by the way, the whale. Uh, Kat Owens is quite simply what being a professor is all about. I was thinking about this for a lot this morning. She is an intellectual, a scholar, and a teacher who combines her passions and talents to reach across disciplinary boundaries, connecting people, educating, and involving communities in political action that is also, by the way, creative and beautiful. This is what a professor and a scholar offers the world. Vision, action, and education that connects research and new knowledge to everyday life. In, in addition to being a professor of politics, the director of the REL Center, and the director of the University Interdisciplinary Studies Program, how does she have the time? Uh, Kat is an official National Geographic Explorer and has been a Fulbright Scholar to India. She, uh, with funding from the National Oceanic and the Atmospheric Administration Marine Debris Prevention Through Education and Outreach Program, just flows off the tongue, <laughs> Kat and her students collected marine debris and presented their findings to the Connecticut General Assembly. And as you may have guessed from the behemoth hanging behind me here in the window, she is also an artist and printmaker. I'm so happy we could bring Kat Owens and the whale here to campus at last. And I'm so excited to hear her speak today about this and all of her other projects. So welcome Dr. Kat Owens. Thank you so much, T. I appreciate that. Um, and thanks to everyone for coming on this beautiful day. I am competing with a very beautiful day when, at that time of the year where we, we Pre, you know, prize them most. So I appreciate you being here. And you can see it all well, and everyone can hear me all right? We're good? Great. So, um, T sort of hit on this a little bit in my introduction, but I really define myself as an interdisciplinary scholar. And I think that's what makes my work, I don't want to say important, but it certainly like makes, makes me um, happy and satisfied with the work I do. I have a background um, in studio art and biology and anthropology. Those were the topics of my undergraduate degrees. And then I did a master's in environmental studies and a PhD in sustainability and governance. And it really, I feel, defines my work. And my work for about the last 20 years has been about water policy, environmental policy around water resources. And in the last decade, that has focused more and more on plastic pollution, which I'm sure you've heard about, <laughs> um, especially single-use plastics. So whereas in the 1950s, global markets were producing about 5 million tons of plastic each year, more recently, it's upwards of 350 million tons every year. And you can read publicly available documents from the plastic industry that they put online for people like me to find. And they make very clear that they want these numbers to go up every single year. That is their stated goal. But of course, many of these items are not in use within 12 months of being manufactured. And so they end up in our ocean and riverways and on the landscape. What we know is that 95% of plastic packaging worldwide is not recycled, and 90.5% of all plastic ever made has never been recycled. And so this idea of recycling is really not in tune with reality. Um, but I think many of us think that we, we put things in our blue bin and we're doing our part to sort of um, solve the problem. So a lot of debris gets removed from landscapes, um, uh, riversides, coastal areas, and from the water every year. For example, in South Korea in 2012, and they picked up 42,000 tons of debris on coastlines. And then there's this annual event called the Ocean Conservancy's Coastal Cleanup. We did a version of it on campus two weeks ago with the Connecticut um, River Council, and it's called the Source to Sea Cleanup, where people all along the Connecticut River are, are cleaning up. So in 2009, um, for the Ocean Conservancy's cleanup, people collected 6.8 million 
pounds of trash. And what's interesting about that, and it also happens on our campus, it's not that when you go back the next year, all the trash is gone. You go back the next year, and there are millions of pounds again. These are annual events. So plastic has solved a lot of problems, right, for our societies. Look around this room. You know, what would this room be like without plastic? Um, it's lightweight. It comes in a lot of different forms. It can be fun formed into, into many different things. Um, but it also has some downsides, and that's what I'm going to talk about. Um, it's that plastics don't break down quickly. Uh, they harm wildlife. They worsen the issue of um, invasive species. They create a toxic soup in our oceans. They cost a lot of money to clean up. And they worsen the issue of climate change. So I'm going to talk about these each individually. I want you to know in a couple of slides there are going to be some animals that have been killed um, from um, entanglement or ingestion. So if that's not something you want to look at on a, a beautiful Friday, <laughs> just know it's coming and it'll be about three or four slides and then it will be over. First, what we know is that plastics don't break down quickly. We actually don't know for most plastics how long it will take them to break down because it really depends on the type of plastic. Think about a, you know, one of these um, tables, <laughs> some of them are, might be plastic, versus a grocery store bag, right? <clears throat> and then also the conditions in which it is found. So something that's on the bottom of the ocean that's not being exposed to sunlight and oxygen is going to break down more slowly than something that's being exposed to wind, sunlight, oxygen, water, all in combination, like something on a on a coastline. Plastic also harms wildlife, and that's sort of the point of this art project that I've been working on, and I'll tell you more about it, of course. And it happens through ingestion, eating the debris, entanglement, getting wrapped up in the debris, and then also because of the way it degrades in the ecosystems that, it, that it's um, deposited in. So here are the, the gruesome slides. Prepare yourselves. Um, the first is a photograph by the artist Christopher Jordan. If you're not familiar with his work, he does amazing work around like statistics and the environment. This is kind of a departure from his usual work, and it's a photograph of a lace and albatross. They are kind of the poster species for the ingestion issue. They nest on the Midway Islands, which are out in the Pacific Ocean, relatively near one of these gyres where debris accumulates. So the adult birds go out into the wild, they, they bring back food for their young, and overwhelmingly, instead of actual edible material, what they're bringing back is pieces of plastic. And those are pieces of plastic that the animal cannot get out of its system one way or another. And so it fills their stomach, so much so that they can't take in enough calories to build the muscle mass to eventually grow larger and then fledge and thrive. And instead, they, they die because they, they've never been able to, to put on enough calories. I saw a D BBC documentary about this about 10 years ago, and they showed this nesting area, and it was just littered with the carcasses of lace and albatross, and Christopher Jordan's series is of hundreds of photographs of these animals. But this is not just something that happens on an island in the Pacific that most of us will never visit. This is a recent article from Beef Magazine, um, to which I do not subscribe, but it sounds like an interesting read. And it was talking about sort of the problems that cattle ranchers face with cattle that eat debris. So there's something called hardware disease, because apparently as they're grazing, cattle, if they encounter bits of metal, maybe screws or uh, nails or that kind of thing, they will sometimes ingest it. And of course, you can imagine, that causes huge problems for these animals. So a version of that is plastic disease, where they are finding now that these um, beef cattle are ingesting plastic while they're out grazing, and it's becoming a problem. And actually, in some of my research in India and in Africa, I've learned that a lot of species like cattle roaming in those um, in countries in those places, um, or elephants, are now an animal that are ingesting a lot of plastic as they kind of roam around communities. The other problem is for the wildlife is with entanglement. This is a photo of a northern gannet from the Helgeland in Germany that is, uh, there's a lot of 
fishing nets and lines near their nesting area, and this animal clearly got caught in it and then um, sadly died. This is a photograph that was shared with me by Helen Masters of the Phillips Island Nature Parks in Victoria, Australia. It's of the Australian fur seal. And this is a group that takes in injured animals and, and tries to help them. She said when this seal came into their clinic, they first thought it had been hit by the propeller of a boat because of this kind of gash on the back of its neck. But then in examining that wound more closely, they found actually at the bottom this very thin string or cord made of plastic. I can't tell exactly if it's like the string from a balloon or maybe some sort of strapping material, but what I can tell is that it's small and relatively lightweight, and yet it caused the death of this animal. They taxidermied the remains to use as a teaching tool. A lot of what we know about entanglement and ingestion for species is from a 1997 book chapter by um, the researcher David Laist. And he was the first person to pull together all the data from people who were studying turtles and sharks and birds and make this sort of master list of animals for which there were records of entanglement, ingestion, or both. And at that time, well, I tell my students, this was before you were born, <laughs> well before you were born, right? Um, at that time, we had records of over 250 different species that were affected by entanglement or ingestion or both. And this is going to be important because this is um, the work that my project is based on. So we'll come back to it later. Some other researchers did an update of that work in 2015. Kuhn et al. found that that number had more than doubled to 557 species. I do think it's important to point out there are two things going on here. Yes, there is more plastic in the ocean during this time, but it's also true that this became something that people study during this time. It went from being anecdotal evidence that lace was gathering while someone was actually looking at something else to do with sharks, for example, to something that researchers are going out and looking for. So I think that elevated number can be attributed to both of those things. Plastic also worsens the issue of invasive species. If you can imagine a piece of driftwood floating from one island chain to another, imagine how far a piece of plastic can go. And it doesn't have to be transporting a large mammal. What researchers are more worried about is actually the microorganisms and bacteria that can go from one ecosystem to another because they're hitchhiking on plastic. Uh, plastic creates a toxic soup in our oceans. You might have heard about one of the gyres of the five gyres, the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, which some people describe as sort of like a floating island of trash. It's not a floating island of trash. It's really more like a churning soup of debris that's slowly breaking down. And what people who study the gyres can tell us is that the number of pieces of plastic in the gyre is the gyres are increasing and the size of those pieces are decreasing. Just like you would imagine if you had a bunch of plastic and something like a washing machine that was just churning it around and around, just slowly breaking down into smaller and smaller pieces. And because of that, um, we know, now know about microplastics and microfibers, nanoplastics. I don't study any of those things, but that's a huge a part of this research area. And plastic pollution costs money particularly to tourism and recreation, shipping, yachting, fisheries, aquaculture, and agriculture. One study of 31 Orange County beaches found that if they could reduce marine debris by 50%, they could generate $67 million in benefits to local residents over a three month period. People love the beach, and people love to go to beaches that they perceive to be clean, and they don't just go and sit on the beach, right? They go and they spend money at restaurants, at bars, they rent houses, they rent sports, sporting equipment, right? Um, and stay there for sometimes, you know, several weeks. So all of that um, can be impacted by beaches that aren't clean. One study by economists looked at the cost of damage caused by marine litter in the 21 Pacific Rim economies and they found that it was about $1 billion of damage each year, mostly to the shipping industry. 
In the UK, in ports and harbors, removing marine litter costs about 2.7 million US dollars each year. And that's different from the money that UK municipalities spend to clean up beaches, which is about 20 million, the equivalent of 20 million US dollars per year. And what's interesting to me about that, right, and all of these industries that are affected, is that it's often taxpayers who are cleaning these areas up, not the industries that, that are causing the problem. Um, plastic pollution is also, um, it worsens the issue of climate change at every stage from its extraction and transport. 99% of plastics are created from fossil fuels. Um, a lot of the fracking that's happening in the United States is not for warming homes or, or other kinds of fuel, it's to make single-use plastics. Um, it also um, exacerbates climate change in the refining and manufacturing of plastic, and then the kind of area that I deal with more frequently in waste management and for plastics in the environment. So this is the point where I tell my students, don't get depressed. <laughs> it's dire, but... Many researchers believe that we can solve the problem of plastic. And what they believe is that we can do that by tackling the root causes of the problem, thinking about the local context, because the debris you find can be very different from area to area, um, considering human behavior, performing education and outreach, and creating strong policy. So with all that in mind, I applied in 2016 for a grant from NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. And the idea behind that grant is that I would take my students, who are um, policy students, they are not science, scientists, they're social scientists, but they're not natural scientists, and I would train them in scientific methods to collect debris. And we would go to, to, to beaches in Connecticut, we would collect debris, we'd catalog it, we tried to understand its source, and then share the results with policymakers at the state level. And eventually, we made our way to Meg's Point at Hammonasset. Um, the beaches of Hammonasset are actually cleaned on a daily basis in the summer. But at Meg's Point, they have all this, these, rocky, these rocky coastlines, right? And we found, it looks beautiful from far off, but when you get close, you can see things are kind of um, tucked between these rocks. And we, we found a good deal of debris over 1,600 individual pieces, and 76% of what we found was plastic. And when we tried to catalog it, understand its source, what we found is it was overwhelmingly what I would call municipal waste. It's the kinds of things that regular people touch every day. It was cigarette butts and, and food packaging, um, flip-flops, children's toys, health and beauty products of all sorts, plastic bottles. So we went, the students, a few students and I went to meet the, at the time, co-chair of the Environmental Committee of the Connecticut General Assembly, who was um, Senator Ted Kennedy Jr., um, to present our results. And because he's a big wig, right, he invited the press there, there was this bank of microphones and all these cameras, and my students got to share their results, which was really, exciting. Only later, right, did we realize that, of course, like, this is not tied to policy making at all. Um, I under only understood later that um, it was after the session, like, after the Connecticut General Assembly that had finished that he made time to meet with us. And it was, for the most part, probably a photo op, right, instead of a direct link to policy change or policy making. But um, I work with my students frequently at the Connecticut General Assembly, and I think this is a great lesson for them because it's not the case that you show up once and meet with a senator, and they hear your ideas and they say, hey, we're gonna change all the policies to what you want, right? The reality is that policymaking is a very slow and incremental process, and so it was a great lesson uh, for my students in that way. We would have loved it if they had changed all the policies, but we accepted reality. So based on that, I was looking forward to a sabbatical. And I started to think about, you know, what could I do that would be exciting or interesting during this time? It's such a great opportunity to do something new. And a lot of the research around plastic pollution really focuses on the problem in South Asia and Southeast Asia. It's sort of considered a hot spot for the issue. And I actually 
have a lot of um, complicated feelings about that characterization, which we will get into. But at the time, I thought, okay, this is a great opportunity to go and sort of take my show on the road. I do think it's really important when you're a uh, researcher from a, developing, from a developed country and you're going to a developing country that you don't just sort of show up and say, hey, I'm here to tell you about your own problems, right? So I did some research to try to find out what Indian researchers thought about the problem of marine debris in their country. And what I found is that many of them were saying that it was an understudied problem. I mean, if you look at the coastline of India, it is enormous. They have a lot of beaches to cover. And so they sort of said, you know, the data is scanty here, and we're interested in more assessment and monitoring, and they use the same methods that I used from NOAA. And so I felt somewhat comfortable reaching out to researchers there to ask them if they would like to collaborate on a project. And I did find um, some researchers at the University of Kerala, which is in southwest India, and applied to a Fulbright grant to go and work there for six months. Um, I took my whole family. It was an amazing, amazing experience. We were here in the state of Kerala. You can't really read it because it's under the star, but we were in a town called Thiruvananthapuram. And the idea was that I would replicate that NOAA project there. I would work with students. I would train them in these methods. We would go out and collect debris. We would catalog it. We would try to understand its source. And then we would try to connect that information with local policymakers. And these are some of the colleagues um, that I worked with there, especially the woman in the center photograph is um, Dr. Jaya. She was my main um, counterpart on that side who I've done all my collaborative work with. So we did a couple of collections over the time there. In March of 2019, we went to Manamkilam Beach, which is very close to the university, and in just a few hours found over 6,000 individual pieces of debris. 84% of that was plastic. And just like in the United States, it was overwhelmingly what I would call municipal waste. Working with Dr. Jaya, I applied for funding from the National Geographic Society. And the idea behind that grant is that we would invite stakeholders from around India to come and join us in Kerala for a week. We would train them on these same methods. And then ideally, they would go back to their home communities and replicate the project. And we received that funding and brought 33 researchers from around India to the University of Kerala to train on the methods and to do a couple of collections. We did one at the Karamana River, which is close by the university, and there we found just over 1,600 pieces. 80% of what we found was plastic. And then we went back to Manamkilam Beach, where we had just been a few months before, and again, found over 6,000 individual pieces of plastic, um, of debris, I should say. 88% of it was plastic. And so we took all this material back to the University of Kerala, and we subdivided it, and cataloged it, and weighed it, and measured it, and counted it, and found it was, again, just like in the United States, mostly municipal waste, the kind of things we touch every day. And from that, we uh, co-published an article about the experience, and of the 33 participants, 10 went back to their home communities and replicated the project all around um, India and including uh, the Andaman Islands, and altogether picked up over 33,000 pieces of debris. Plastic was always the most frequently found item, but it ranged in proportion from 45% of what they collected to 89%. So having been Having received a grant from National Geographic, uh, I became a National Geographic explorer. And they have a really nice community where they do a lot of work to try to support uh, the explorers. And they offered an opportunity where you could work with other explorers to propose a project. So I met two other researchers on the sort of web interface of National Geographic, a river ecologist from Uganda named Hannington Ocheng, and a social scientist from Indonesia named Puspita Kamil. And together we proposed a project where we would replicate this along the Aturukuku River in Tororo, Uganda. So it's fall of 2019. I'm back from, <laughs> start your laughter now, right? I'm back from India. My family's had this incredible experience, you know, just a life, lifetime kind of experience. 
I'm working with colleagues on campus to co-create classes, you know, based on this project. I'm planning a return trip to India to collaborate with my, my friends there. I'm publishing and speaking about the project. We've got this Uganda thing all set for summer of 2020. I was just about to go in March of 2020 to Colombia in South America to lead a workshop. And I thought, 2020 is really going to be my year. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, everyone knows what happens next, right? Uh, 2020 was no one's year. Um, and I don't have to explain to anyone like how crushing it was, right, to have all of your plans, you know, destroyed, right? In addition to all of the research being canceled, my, and I don't have to explain to anyone who works at the university either about this, of course, like your, your roles and responsibilities on campus changed drastically. I went from being a part-time administrator of about um, 90 faculty to trying to get all of those folks online, you know, under deadline as quickly as possible. Some people who had never taught online before, had never used Blackboard before. So, you know, it was, it was a rough period of time. And it was, it was difficult. I was struggling to manage all of that. And I started thinking about the arts in general and how they help us understand things. And there's a lot of research out there. Because I have this arts background, I feel very strongly like that the arts can reach audiences that certainly one of my scientific articles cannot reach, right? Um, but the research shows that the arts can help engage diverse learners on social topics. And some researchers believe that it can help create empathy for the natural environment, but in terms of environmental education, that it's a bit underutilized. And so I started thinking about kind of the way we frame the story of plastic pollution in general. You can read articles that say very bluntly, I mean, this is part of what, what guided me to go and work in, in South Asia, but there are articles that say these are the 10 dirtiest rivers in the world. These are the 10 worst polluting countries, and they are inevitably in South Asia and Southeast Asia. But the truth is, I touch plastic every day of my life, right? And it's inescapable for most of us. But when I use plastic, I put it in a plastic bag, right? <laughs> if it's not recyclable. I put it in a plastic can. I you know, wheel it to the bottom of the driveway or convince one of my children to do that. And then it gets picked up and I never have to think about it again. But the truth is, in the best case scenario, it's going to be landfilled or incinerated. And so it's not necessarily that the United States or the developed world has solved the problem of plastic waste at all. It's that we're better at hiding that problem. And so I thought, how could I, how could I help people better understand sort of our own connection? to plastic waste and use the arts to do so. So I had been, <laughs> think of me what you will, but I had been making these sort of pieces out of plastic uh, before I went to India, uh, kind of, you know, portraits of, um, of different sea creatures by sewing plastic onto canvas. But it wasn't really sort of like thematic or cohesive in a, any way. I think some were more successful than others. But I kept doing it, and so they were getting bigger and bigger. And I enjoyed it, but I didn't really feel like it told a story, necessarily. So I thought, how could I use these elements to tell a, what I thought was more honest story about the way plastic connects to all of our lives? So I went back to that Laced article from 1997. And if you remember, there were over 250 species at the time that were affected by plastic pollution through entanglement or ingestion. So within that list was a shorter list of 46 animals for which at that time there were records of both entanglement and ingestion. So I thought, you know, to me it sounds like they're the most at risk. And so I thought I could create portraits of all of these animals. <laughs> and these are the ones I've finished. The ones in green, I, I'm very close to finishing. Um, I'm almost done with the project. In fact, the great white shark, I just haven't had a chance to roll it out in my driveway. I think it's done. So it's, it's very close to getting grayed out. But to make it interesting and also meaningful, I wanted to make them all to scale. Because I am a visual learner, and to see the different scale 
of the, of the species, I think, can help us understand a problem. So some of them are cute, you know, little creatures, and then the largest species on the list are the sperm whale, uh, which is just over 60 feet at, at its largest, and the bowhead whale, which the portrait of the bowhead whale is 55 feet wide. And my process is just to take canvas and to just quickly sketch the animal on there with, with chalk, nothing crazy. And then I start sewing, hand sewing the plastic onto the canvas to create the portrait. And I'm just going to quickly go through them. You can see the size of each one on the screen. This is getting larger. This one's 15 feet long. A lot of seabirds on the list, sadly. Many turtles as well. Also, the animals that are sort of naturally curious often are on the list because they go up and check out things that they see floating in the water. This is the portrait of the Laysan albatross, that sort of poster species for the problem. That's the bread my family uses, <laughs> thinking. Red, if you recognize it. So for the largest pieces, anything sort of over 20 feet, I thought it's practical to work with the public on these. Um, and so fortunately, by the summer of 2021, I started this project in February of 2021. So by the summer of, of 2021, last summer, I was able to go to camps and clubs and sort of organizations to work with students. So I first took the minky whale around to, to groups and I came to Summer Place here, um, the Free Center in Hartford and in Middletown, uh, a sewing school in Middletown, I'm sorry, in Hartford and other organizations. That's the Free Center in Middletown. And eventually we completed the minky whale, which all told is 18 feet by seven feet. And then I started in kind of December of last year with the sperm whale. This is at my children's school, McDonough in Middletown. They had a fun only day where the kids wore pajamas. And I was like, what was happening in the gym? There were goats in the library. That's, I had to compete with goats, but they came to my thing too, so it was fine. And then through um, generous support of the Middletown Downtown Business District, they allowed me to use an empty storefront that had been formerly been a Woolworths on Main Street in Middletown um, to allow sort of like just the public to drop in and contribute to the project, which was a huge help because otherwise, you know, where do you put your 60 foot art project? And so people would come in in small groups. This was from December of 2021 through kind of May of 2022. You can see this is this whale taking shape. And then eventually I got to the place where I could use a sewing machine to sew those long panels together. And that's what, of course you can see the real deal, but that's me for scale next to it, um, the sperm whale. And uh, the third whale we're working on right now, uh, the bowhead whale. And this is at a school in Middletown. And I don't know if this will work. This is me at um, choked last Friday, a week ago. They had a community service day and invited me to bring the whale. And so they had faculty and staff and students who worked on it for about four hours. And I made this little video of that. So for me, there's a lot of value in combining the arts and science and policy. I think we, we separate the arts and sciences arbitrarily. <laughs> Um, and, and so I, I think it's an important part of my work. I want to keep doing it. I hope to continue. 
uh, the, that later article about the entanglement and ingestion, uh, when I review the 500 plus animals on that list, there's a new list of 73 species that have records of both entanglement and ingestion. So I kind of feel like I have my work cut out for me for the next five years or so. <laughs> and that's, that's it, thank you. I worked, I worked a little bit with Michelle Klimczak at Fishers Island, which is just out in the Sound, and she would describe the tons of material that came up from Sandy, and that they had to, you know, it, it goes where it goes based on currents, and so the communities that have suffered the hurricanes are not often, are necessarily the ones who get all the debris. And it's, yeah, it's probably millions and millions of dollars of cleanup. Right, right on reefs and things yeah. like that. It could, yeah, it causes a lot of havoc. I have a question about local action, just in terms of institutions like we're a university, and you know, if you get catering done, there's plastic cups like the cafeteria has a lot of plastic in the packaging, um, and I'm just kind of, yes, yeah, I'm standing there and thinking to myself, like, at what point, like, how do we get our own institutions to change? regard to this, but also, like, you think about the government, the state government, or the, the capital, right? And I was just curious if you work with students at all on that level of trying to make change, because I think your project's amazing, and you're highlighting really important issues. Thank you. Um, yeah, I was watching, I think it was the January 6th hearings, and I was like, please, with the bottled water, everybody has bottled water. It's like, somebody fill up a carafe and spread the glasses out. Like, if you can't afford it, who can? Who can? But, um, yeah, I mean, I, I have asked my students in the past to, they've gotten involved in state-level policy advocacy. And then we've also have had them sort of investigate what's happening on campus. And, you know, I think like everything, there are a lot of factors uh, that come into play, including cost and then the demand, right? So I think that the cafeteria has moved to some sustainable, um, like plates and, and boxes and stuff. Um, but I, you know, many people expect there to be plastic straws or plastic bottles when they go to places. So I think it takes like uh, people, um, more people advocating and saying, that's not what we want, this is what we want. There are certainly colleges, college campuses that have been plastic free for a decade, you know? But you have to have the, the student body that's demanding that. I think the students have a lot of power in that because they are, the, in many ways, the consumer, right? Um, and I try to get people to think about um, the consumer choices because I don't know if you've tried to go to a grocery store lately or a, or a Rite Aid and get out of there without any plastic, it's impossible. I went through a whole Rite Aid with my camera, I made a TikTok looking for things that weren't made of plastic or wrapped in plastic. And it was the books, the magazines, and only some of the greeting cards. Everything else is plastic. So I think we have to communicate with the people who make things and say, we don't want this to come in plastic anymore. And then also, you know, the Federally, uh, the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act has been on the, the you know, has been proposed, uh, but there's a lot going on <laughs> right now, and I don't know if that's, you know, everyone, I, certainly it's not everyone's number one issue, and so, you know, I think both in terms of the economic side of it as consumers and the political side of it as citizens, more people have to say something and let leaders know that they want something different. Yeah. And take out and delivery yeah. and you're just you're just exploding the amount yes. of plastic and debris. And I I mean it's exponential, an exponential increase during COVID. And it makes it like, oh, you need this single use 
stuff that you won't get, you won't get disease, but ultimately all the garbage is causing all the disease. I mean, listen to the reports in Pakistan and, mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, the water, people need water. Right, right. There are some organizations that, I wrote an article about um, this organization called the Alliance to End Plastic Waste, which is funded by the largest manufacturers of plastics in the world. It's like a consortium. And we contrasted their, their policy recommendations with a group called Common Seas that is really looking to solve the problems at, their, at the root. You know, so for example, they say, if we're going to address plastic water bottles, we need to have clean water. People need to have clean water that they can drink, right? So that we, we're not just making people feel bad for have, when they have no choice, really, um, between safe water and you know, plastic water bottles are not safe either, but it's, it's not full of lead, necessarily. Um, yeah, COVID was a huge increase in the amount of single-use plastics. Um, one of the, another National Geographic explorer, uh, Justina Mendelia, published the first article about plastic from COVID in cities, and it was because she was stuck at home. <laughs> she like went to visit her parents and got stuck there. And so she and her partner would just take a walk around Toronto every day and record the uh, PPE that they saw. And um, then as a follow-up to that study, uh, she invited researchers from around the world, including me. I walked around Middletown every day, I'm sorry, once a week for 10 weeks last summer and collected PPE and <laughs> recorded what I found. Um, but it's everywhere. And there were a lot of choices that were made in the short term that you know, ultimately they found were not necessary. For example, in Connecticut, we had moved to bring your own bag at the grocery store. Because of COVID, people were like, that's not sanitary, you have to use a plastic bag. Well, when they finally did research, they found that the germs stayed on the plastic longer than they did on, on your canvas bag. But of course, you can't know that before the, ca the case, and, and you can't argue for something like that if, if there are health risks or health concerns. But I can't walk anywhere without seeing a mask or some sort of PPE on the ground, and I think that's going to be an ongoing problem for decades. I don't know why recycling bins on campus have started to disappear. I, I think that I have always heard that it's complicated because we are arranged across three municipalities, West Hartford, Hartford, and Bloomfield, but um, I don't know. I think it's, you know, the, the recycling markets have pretty much disappeared in the last five years. Uh, it used to be when um, Chinese goods would come over, you know, ships would come over full of Chinese goods for, for us because we love our cheap, you know, goods. Um, they would fill with bundled recycled material, you know, recyclable materials and take them back to China um, to be downcycled. That was my bag. Um, but because of a policy change that they made, I think in 2019, uh, called the National Sword Policy, they decided to no longer accept our waste which I think is their right to, to do. And now a lot of that waste, you know, in terms of like municipalities and city governments, whereas they used to make a little bit of money on that, it's, it's a, you know, they lose money on it now. And so it's, it's very complicated. I think it, in terms of the United States, we need to have a way to deal with our own waste and not rely on other countries. It's still being shipped legally to some other countries and illegally um, around the world. I see a question now. Um, I wanted to ask about your artistic process. I noticed that you, know, you talked about drawing into things. How about, could you talk a little bit about collecting your garbage for how you're choosing what you choose in terms of color and mm -hmm. materials and that sort of thing? Yeah. Um, so this is not the plastic that I find on the beach. That stuff is really gross and has things growing on it. You wouldn't want it, you know, in your library for sure. Um, I, I saved all the plastic my family used for about five years because I was trying to figure out what to do with it. I couldn't figure out how to recycle it. Um, so I have a, a kind of trove. It's not that my, I see you imagining like a house with like a hoarder house with like plastic. plastic. It's not like that. It compresses. It's in like some bins. It's 
pretty organized in a one room of the house. Um, and I have it by color. And you know, you can't use everything. Um, some things are are better to work with than others. So for example, potato chip bags were made to split open easily. And so they kind of shred. And I have used them occasionally, but I, I try to avoid them. So I have it divided by color, and then I, I kind of work with um, with what uh, you know, with the image of the animal, and just try to try to match that. A good example, actually, is the stellar sea lion, where I was desperate for like brown hues, like middle, you know, not super dark um, and not tan, but like warm brown hues. And people don't package a lot of things in brown, you know. They're focused on bright colors that will grab you, you know, grab your eye. So I eventually, with this one, just use like a combination of oranges and, and darker browns interspersed with sort of more like yellow or taupe to kind of build, you know, so from far away your eye kind of sees like a brown, a warmer brown chest. But um, I normally just try to let the the, you know, let it dictate to me. I try to follow, but I don't go crazy about um, making it perfect. I want it to look rough. I hate plastic, right? So I don't want you to think like, I mean, it's okay if you think it's beautiful, but you know, it's like, I don't like plastic. It really drives me crazy. And then when I'm working with the public, you know, uh, <laughs> all rules are off the table. Um, I had, uh, you know, I save like blues because I'm always looking for blue backgrounds and I was working with some kids at one point and I gave them, you know, this like sheet of blue that I had saved and it was a big piece and I turned around and like came back and they had already like sewn it with the blue side down. Wow. So it was just like gray and I was like, well, okay, that's how it's going to be. <laughs> so you have to sort of, if you're doing anything with the public collaboratively, you just have to separate yourself from like too much control because it's not possible. But I like that it looks like regular people made it and that, and I think that it, it works fine. Kathy, yeah, you did this presentation. I love the communal aspect of this project and I wonder if you could share any like memorable conversations you've had with people you've worked with or revelations they have had kind of like on the opposite end of the spectrum of Michelle's question. Mm -hmm. Oh, good. And so I wonder how else that's happening. I mean, that's my ultimate goal, right, is for people to connect it with their um, everyday lives and everyday behavior. And I actually just got permission to do a survey for people who, who I give the lecture to or who I hold workshops with or who see the um, um, exhibitions because I'm interested in understanding like what impact it might have. But um, when people are working on it, inevitably, whether they're children or my age or older, people start to recognize things, right? And for me, that's kind of the point, right? That you see yourself there. Because I certainly see myself there. And, and it's not something that we need to point a finger to India, right? Or Vietnam or Indonesia, um, because it's a huge problem here. And so what I'm hoping people will do is make that connection. But I find often people know about the issue, they already care about the issue, but then they go to the store and everything's in plastic. And so I think it's sort of like that communication piece where we're trying to let the people who make things know that we want something different. That's like sort of the crux of it. Um, you know, I love this project. I've heard you talk about it before. And I was just wondering, since we already talked about Aramark, and Aramark's going to get a black eye, they always do, and I'm not saying that they shouldn't, but um, I know they've done a lot more um, for uh, recycling and composting than they ever did before, and I was wondering, and since we've already talked about, you know, the committee and what we could do for Earth Day, maybe for next April, mm -hmm. could we ask Aramark, and I'm assuming you know more about this than I do, because I don't, I uh -huh. know nothing that they could do what you did, which is to collect all their recyclables between now and April, and do it as a, as a university project? You mean film plastics or everything? 
everything. Just to show I, it. I, I mean, that's something that students everything. do at other places. They do yeah. a waste audit, and they go through the garbage, and they pull out what could have been composted, what could, could only be thrown away, and what could be recycled. I mean, I think... I, I mean, I, I don't imagine Aramark sitting around twiddling their thumbs, like looking for more work. Um, so that's the key, right? Who could do that project? I mean, I think it would it would mean a lot to the students and for all of us to see, you know, what our waste looks like uh, over time. They are great about composting, and I think they've been trying to share that information more with the students so they understand how much food waste they're pre preventing. But that's just one part of the story. Tell us just a little bit about your trip next week. So, <laughs> I've been invited by the Virgin Corporation to take a transatlantic journey from Spain to Miami and lead a series of eight sewing workshops on a giant boat. <laughs> <laughs> they have a policy where they have no single-use plastics on their ships. And someone saw my project in Middletown and reached out to me through Instagram. And my mom was like, how do you know that they're not trying to kidnap you? <laughs> <laughs> no one's trying to kidnap a 48-year-old like, woman. You know? Like, that's not what's happening here. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, so they, they want to offer programming to the, the people on the ship that is meaningful. And so I'm going to be talking about plastic pollution, and we're going to be creating a 12-foot striped dolphin portrait. Thank you. Um, just before we end, really quickly, obviously, thank you to Kat, but I also want to thank my assistant, Ann Brown, and Carrie Cushman of the Hartford Art School, and facilities. <laughs> who bore with us trying to get this behemoth up. Uh, it was uh, uh, definitely a community, another community yes. effort, and I really appreciate everyone's input. Uh, we couldn't have done it with, without everybody's help. So uh, thank you all. Have some snacks. Please eat the stuff, because if we don't eat it, it'll become food waste. <laughs> <laughs>